Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, fellow time travellers, whatever time of day you're encountering this content. It's lovely to see you. It's always lovely to have you with me. I don't want to travel through all of that time and all of that history on my own, so thank you for your company. Um, We here in this uh, family of like-minded, curious types, we pay attention to history uh, because we believe that in that great deep reservoir of human experience lie the answers to present day problems. Whatever is happening to us, pestilence, famine, war, death, uh, celebrity, love island, whatever you want, it's all happened before and if they coped with it in the past, we can repurpose their solutions to help us cope with our present and look forward to the future. Uh, Before I get started on today's uh, broadcast, just thanks to all the people who support the Patreon presence. Uh, It's the patreon.com site that makes the rest of the podcasts possible. The Love Letter to the British Isles, the Love Letter to the World are, always have been and always will be free, but that's because of the financial input via Patreon. So if you're not a member and you'd like to become a member, go to patreon.com, search for me by name, sign up, follow the directions, part with a bit of cash, either monthly or annually. It's cheaper if you go for the whole year, I'm telling you now. And you get access to a community, a family of like-minded, curious, uh, history-loving types. We do question and answers, competitions, podcasts, vodcasts, whatever you call these things that you watch on your phone or your tablet or your computer screen. Um, Okay, that's enough about the advert. It's time to go. Time to strap yourselves into the time machine as we set off towards the next stop on our love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. sense heartbreak. You can sense a man's heart breaking across the edge of war. In this podcast, we're stepping into the maelstrom which ripped the British Isles apart. A bloody storm sweeping across three kingdoms. Charles I, the king with a god complex, went head to head with increasingly bold parliamentarians. Bitter internecine politics and deadly power plays led to armies being raised. Families, neighbours and lifelong friends pitted against each other as people were compelled to pick a side and face each other in the blood and gore of lethal combat as the country was gripped and ripped by civil war. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Hi Neil. In the last podcast, we watched a groundbreaking document being signed and the whole of the British Isles slide into a devastating civil war. Where are we now? This week, we're right at the sharp end, right on the bleeding edge of the civil war. We're in the beautiful rolling hills of the West Country, where a brutal, bloody battle was fought that throws the personal tragedy of this war into sharp relief, the horror and the heroism side by side with intimate heartbreak of friends, families and neighbours having to fight against each other to the death. We're near the city of Bath and it's the Battle of Lansdowne Hill. You know this place, Paul, way back when, when you and I were making two men in a trench together. This was one of the places that we visited. Do you remember? I do indeed. Lansdowne Hill outside Bath, outside the lovely city of Bath. You, me and Tony yeah. and the rest, we all went and uh, had a bit of a recce. It was all this sort of patchwork of landowners and one of the landowners didn't want anything to do with the project. So we had to move on and it was such a shame because we all agreed that it was a fantastically atmospheric location. Yeah, with the history at the forefront of our minds, the landscape took on a real aura, didn't it? Yeah, there's, there's some places, a lot of places that you go to where once upon a time there was a battle. 
because Lansdowne Hill is the scene of a battle of the English Civil War, but a lot of the times when you go to battles of whatever period, it's hard to imagine anything happening. They've maybe been built up with houses or, or there's a road running through them or whatever, and they don't feel important. Or there's no residual atmosphere of, of anything having happened there. But Lansdowne, I'm sure you agree, felt like there was something lingering, like the smoke of battle was still hanging over it. When you're up on the Lansdowne escarpment, which is obviously the high ground, the level ground on top, and you look away towards the north, and you're looking off towards two hills, Freezing Hill and Tog Hill. The ground of Lansdowne Hill, it's steep. Remember, it was all overgrown with trees and bushes. But at the time, back in the 17th century, when the battle took place, it would have been more open. It's got an atmosphere. It's got a a feeling. And then when you come back a few hundred yards back from the edge, back onto the escarpment, there's a dry stone wall running straight, kind of like from east to west. The wall is absolutely the heart of of the Battle of, of Lansdowne Hill because it's where one side eventually, after hours of fighting, they took shelter behind it to kind of catch their breath and just use it for a bit of a, a defensive position. Those that took shelter behind the wall were, were parliamentarians The English Civil War was fought between a royalist force in support of King Charles I and a parliamentarian force who supported the aims of Parliament, obviously. So it was those who were opposing the King and supporting Parliament that ended up taking position on the wall. You know, before we get to that, civil war is something that it's always on my mind. Just generally, because a civil war, I think, is the ugliest, cruelest wound, really, that a population could inflict upon themselves. It's one thing to go to war against another country or an, or another tribe, but a civil war is one that, that happens within a population, where what had been a cohesive group splits into two sides and they go at each other's throats. And invariably and inevitably, it means that the splitting runs right through families. So it'll divide people politically and it'll divide people around an ideology, either side of an ideology. But invariably you'll get brother against brother, father against son, because even within families there are disagreements. And there's something terribly cruel and sad about families and a population splitting, falling apart in that way. So I think about civil war in that sense, in it being such a cruel and sad event. But also, I think about it because I feel that it's always dangerous to be complacent in thinking that civil wars are something that happened in the past or they're something that happened to other people. Because I feel, in reality, there's only ever a gossamer thin division between us and that kind of war. I don't suppose the people of Syria 20 years ago would have believed that their country would be rent by a decades-long civil war. They wouldn't have seen it coming. And in the Balkans, the civil war that tore the Balkans apart before that, American civil war, English civil war, everyone's had them. And just because ours happened in the 17th century isn't to say it couldn't happen again. And you've got to be vigilant. And when I think about my anxiety about the possibility of violence, I always think about what happened at Lansdowne Hill because with all wars, be it the First World War or the Second World War or the, or the English Civil War they can be overwhelming the scale of them and the number of people that get swept up in them and I always find it helpful to narrow it down to something small a microcosm where you get a sense of it and for me the, there's something of the inestimable sadness of civil war is conjured into being by remembering what happened at Lansdowne. Charles I, he was Scottish insofar as he was of Scottish descent, but he'd really lived his life in England, in London. He was the son of James VI and first, James VI of Scotland, first of England. While his father had been canny and had understood people generally, 
Charles less so. James had maybe mistakenly raised Charles to believe that kings were little gods set upon their thrones by the big god and that they had a divine right. And Charles took that strongly to heart. And so whenever he was challenged, for example, by his parliament, he tended to be very lofty about his attitude to them. So effectively what you ended up with in the 1630s, 1640s was a king who treated his subjects like children. And some of those children were demanding to be treated like grown-ups. So that the stage was set for trouble. Charles, in particular, he believed that Parliament should just gather the taxes that he needed for his own endeavours. <laughs> just give me the money. Don't ask any stupid questions. And we discussed just very recently that Charles got into trouble with uh, the Scots during the 1630s by trying to tell them to change the way that they were worshipping God. They were all Protestants, but there were variations on a theme Charles wanted them to do it his way with bishops and a new, co- a new book of common prayer. The Scots absolutely refused. He sent an army up to try and force them to do what he was telling them and they, they beat him off. Uh, the Scots beat him back and Charles was livid, <laughs> absolutely incandescent. So he, he had no recourse but to go to his parliament in London and ask them for money, more money, to raise another army and to go up and try and do it all again. And because... There was this atmosphere at the time of the Parliament wanting the King to treat them as adults and to take seriously the notion that they had a right to have some say in how the country was being run. They used his shortage of money as leverage. They had him kind of where they wanted him. If you want money, there's going to have to be a bit of quid pro quo. It was part of a long tradition, really. I mean, the Parliament in, in England had evolved over hundreds of years. And from the time of King John and Magna Carta, where a king was forced to put his seal on a document that said that even the king wasn't above the law. Well, in the intervening centuries, that, that idea had developed and really properly taken root. And so by the time of Charles I, Parliament in England really felt, we've got rights here. It's not just the king does what the king wants. We've also got input. So Charles asks for money and they say only if you'll do some of the things that we want. And to cut a long story short, Charles spat his dummy out of the pram and went off in a massive huff. He went north to Nottingham where he figured he'd be more welcome. And the truth was, before the fighting started, and but when the division had, had formed between King and Parliament, Royalist camp and Parliamentarian camp, it tended to be the people of the countryside that favoured the king and the people of the urban areas the cities favoured parliament that was the way it tended to break down and Charles intuited as much and got himself out of London and got himself to where he thought he would have more instinctive support and he was right there was an initial inconclusive battle at a place called Edge Hill where there was a bit of a, a formal set to between the two opposing armies, but it ended in a, in a kind of a goalless draw. It didn't really amount to much. And that was in the, uh, the October of 1642. But by the summer of the following year, Charles was headquartered in Oxford. That was where he had his, his HQ and his base of operations. And at that time, down in the southwest, Further south and west from from Oxford, there was a a large royalist force commanded by a chap called Sir Ralph Hopton. And they were trying to make their way up to join up with the king and his army. And then together they would push for London, because it was all about getting control of London. Uh, So, you know, Charles had intentions of getting enough men and armaments together to go and push to control the capital. And obviously Parliament, for its own part, was determined that that wouldn't happen. And so to, to intercept the force, the Royalist force coming up from the south and west, they had their man, Sir William Waller, who was holding Bath. He would be the immovable object and face the unstoppable force kind of thing. Hopton, the Royalist commander, he had the numbers. He definitely had the numerical advantage. He had about 4,000 infantrymen and 2,500 cavalry. So Parliament 
had to get men towards Bath to support Waller. And this was done partly with a force of cavalry out of London, commanded by Sir Arthur Hazelrig. And these guys were like, they were an anachronism even then. They were dressed in armour, effectively. Breastplates, helmets and armour covering their legs down to the shins, which was garb for fighting men from another era, really. They were antiquated in an era where there were heavy artillery on the battlefield. They, They were an anachronism. They were out of date. But there were quite a lot of them and they were well trained and well led. They called them lobsters because they looked like men in shells. So they duly made their way up to Bath to bolster William Waller. So you've got a kind of an uneven conflict coming. The royalist, Sir Alf Hopton, is on the move and he's got the bigger force. But Waller's already there. He's kind of holding the ground. So it's anybody's guess. Now... The point at which it becomes heartbreaking and where it crystallises everything that you need to remember about a civil war is in the relationship between the two men, Hopton and Waller. Because although by 1643 they were commanding opposing armies, they were lifelong friends. They had grown up together. They'd been friends from boyhood. They were best friends. They went to the same church. For the longest time, they sat together in Parliament. They were both political men. And for the longest time, they had shared the same opinions about many matters that were important to the realm and the population. But when Charles made his move against Parliament, when he broke from Parliament, while Hopton felt that he had to back the king, William Waller decided that he would back Parliament. And so these two men, who'd been best friends, sat together, played together, learned together, socialised together, suddenly found themselves on opposite sides. And then, to make matters worst of all, they realised that they were going to have to fight each other. Their two opposing armies might not have come face to face, but destiny, fate dictated that they did and they realised that they were going to clash at Lansdowne. And so Hopton, in the weeks before, had been writing to William Waller, asking if they could meet, if they could you know, come together for some sort of face-to-face discussion. But William Waller probably quite rightly thought there was no point, because it wasn't as though one was going to switch sides to the other. There was going to be a conflict. And so rather than meet William Waller sent his friend Ralph Hopton this letter, and I'll read it out in full. It's one of the most famous documents of the English Civil War. To my noble friend Sir Ralph Hopton at Wells, Sir, the experience I have of your worth and the happiness I have enjoyed in your friendship are wounding considerations when I look at this present distance between us. Certainly, my affection to you is so unchangeable that hostility itself cannot violate my friendship. But I must be true wherein the cause I serve. That great God, which is the searcher of my heart, knows with what a sad sense I go about this service, and with what a perfect hatred I detest this war without an enemy. But I look upon it as an opus domini, that's God's work, and that's enough to silence all passion in me. The God of peace, in his good time, will send us peace. In the meantime, we are upon the stage and must act those parts that are assigned to us in this tragedy. Let us do so in a way of honour and without personal animosities. Whatever the outcome, I will never willingly relinquish the title of your most affectionate friend, William Waller. I just find that Even in the formality of the language, language from another time, you can sense heartbreak. You know, you can sense a man's heart breaking across the edge of war, across the sharp edge of war. You can feel it. To think they were about to go into battle to kill each other, literally. Yes, yes, they they knew it was coming. And in those days, commanders commanded from the front they'd be there. They might see each other. The one might see the other die. Everything about it is 
it brings the reality of, of civil war right into your face. So it's the 5th of July, 1643. Both had been determined to get to high ground in the vicinity of Bath, and that high ground was, was Lansdowne, Lansdowne Hill. And Waller, because of his geographical proximity to the place, he got there first, and he, he got his men to dig in on the escarpment. And they, they dug in, they dug trenches with the embankments in front of them. And then the Royalist cavalry emerged and they get in amongst them and they charged the parliamentarian force, but they were repulsed, beaten off more than once. There were Cornish foot soldiers in Hopton's Royalist army and they were armed with pikes. Remember when we did Flodden, the Battle of Flodden, and, and the Scots were armed with those 18 foot long spears and it was a disaster. Well, the Cornishmen at Lansdowne Hill were practised in the use of these things. So they got up, they got, somehow got up that slope out onto the escarpment and they brought these spears to bay. They were incredibly brave and, and Waller sent his cavalry to drive them back. So there's, you know, there's all these clashes back and forth between mounted men and men on the ground, men armed with spears. And in amongst the Cornish pikemen was a, a legend, a guy with the luxurious name of Sir Bevel Grenville. And he was an experienced warrior, an experienced royalist, and he was killed. He was chopped down, cut down by the parliamentarian cavalrymen. But the, the men that he was commanding, they held a position and the whole thing became a deadlock on this escarpment. The royalists with their back to the slope and the parliamentarians elsewhere on the field. And eventually Waller pulled his men back to the wall, this dry stone wall that's there today and that was there then. And they got behind the wall and they scooped out depressions lowering the wall in certain places so that they could bring in their heavy guns so that the barrels of the guns were over the walls through the walls pointing at the men and on it went there's hundreds dead by this point corpses and wounded men and dying men littered all over the place but neither side would give in the day was over darkness fell still they were fighting but by this point neither side and neither commander wanted to commit to a, a final charge they didn't want to put men in the field again and try and do something conclusive. In those days, the muskets were lit by a piece of burning cord and a lever would dip it down into the powder when the trigger was pulled and it would ignite the powder. And eventually what happened was that Waller, William Waller, the parliamentarian commander, he ordered his men to light cords and lay them along the wall so that for the royalists looking through the darkness it looked as if there were still men manning the wall and the parliamentarians just withdrew went away to live to fight another day and so technically the royalists were left in command of the field and technically you might say they had triumphed but much like Edge Hill basically men had fought themselves to a standstill We've said before, historians often prefer to call it the War of the Three Kingdoms because it swept up Scotland and it swept up Ireland and it swept up England. So it's called the English Civil War, but it affected the whole place. And eventually the, the English Civil War then ran its, ran its course. 1651, Parliament were ultimately victorious. Charles was taken. Charles was tried and executed. And then, of course, you know, you go into the Commonwealth led by Oliver Cromwell and the rest of it. But back to Hopton and Waller. Hopton had stayed on the Royalist side and, until the end. And like many others, when Parliament was victorious, he had to flee. So he left the country and eventually he died in Bruges of fever in 1652, just the year after the war. And Waller, his lifelong friend, he, he stayed behind, uh, was still a member of Parliament. But he looked on at what Oliver Cromwell was doing and, well, it turned his stomach. He was appalled by Cromwell, and appalled by what the, the Commonwealth became. And by the end of his life, he was campaigning for the restoration of the monarchy. He was trying to put another king back on the throne. He died in 1668, so a, a long time after Hopton. And that letter from Waller to Hopton is the last known contact between the two men. So as, as far as we know, those two that had been boys and men and had been friends and had loved one another, never heard from each other, never saw each other again. 
And so you, you go to Lansdowne Hill now and the wall's still there and it's called Waller's Wall. And if you look at it and pay attention to it, you can at least trick yourself into thinking you can see patches along it where depressions have been made in it and then repaired. You can almost trick yourself into thinking you can see where perhaps the, the parliamentarian guns were. There's a monument, a quite dishevelled, overgrown thing now to Sir Bevel Grenville, commemorates him and his Cornishmen, but I would say the wall is the memorial because in some respects it's what a civil war is all about. It's about a line drawn and a wall draws a line and when you're confronted with a wall you have to pick what side of it to stand on and such is the nature of civil war. Pick a side and it's all there. All the heartbreak of civil war is there at Lansdowne Hill. Does the wall, which is nearly 400 years old, give you a frisson and connection to the events? Yeah, it, it adds hugely to the atmosphere, I think. It, when you can go to a battlefield of any period, really, but one is, that's, that's hundreds of years old, when you can encounter a feature in the landscape that you absolutely know played a pivotal part, that's very powerful. That's the wall. And in 1643, there were men sheltering behind it. There were guns being fired across it. When it comes to visiting somewhere and trying to imagine what happened, at a place like Lansdowne Hill, because of that wall, it's relatively straightforward to imagine what happened. You can crouch down behind the wall, you can play the part of a parliamentarian, or you can run towards the wall, you know, and imagine being a royalist trying to get in amongst that opposing force. But the battlefield is much more than that. It's an atmospheric place laden with somehow the residue of that conflict. The touching personal angle at the heart of this battle really throws into sharp relief the tragic impact of civil wars, doesn't it? Y yes, you can imagine, you can imagine if you were being invaded, say, by a foreign country, or if it was thousands of years ago and your tribal lands were being invaded by another tribe or another clan, you can imagine feeling the urge to defend your patch against the aggressor. And so ugly though the business of killing and dying might be in any context, you can see that the urge would be there to defend family and kith and kin and property. But when, as you say, the fault line runs through families... That's a terrible thing. You know, Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag Archipelago, he said, when you get right down to it, the line separating good and evil, it doesn't pass between political parties, doesn't run through countries, but runs directly through every human heart. And that each of us is good and bad in equal parts, and each one of us has the potential to be a, a good person or a monster at any given moment. And it's only our actions that define us. And that line separating good and evil, that line passing through every human heart, it's made manifest in the case of a civil war because the line between the two sides will pass through families and through friendships. Not in every case, of course, but from time to time and in, and in many cases, you know, it happens, it happened in the American Civil War. The father would be on one side, the son would be on the other and sometimes they would find themselves facing each other across no man's land. War is indiscriminate and doesn't preserve families, and doesn't preserve friendships, and doesn't preserve relationships. It does quite the opposite. Where you want people to be able to continue to talk and discuss and air their views, you know, jaw, jaw, instead of war, war. Where people, one side or another, is being told to shut up, then the side that's told to shut up is left, it, it doesn't change its mind. It just runs out of any peaceable ways to express its unhappiness. And once you cross that line, that's when the knives and guns come out. If the talking stops and the fighting starts, there you go. You got yourself the makings of a civil war. Uh, and I think it, it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to be vigilant at all times because civil wars are not just in the past. They're in the wings, waiting to come centre stage and do it all again. And we've got to be careful. The Civil War is often reduced to clichés, isn't it? Dashing royalists versus doer, resolute parliamentarians. This battle 
with its two leaders, one a lord and the other a sir, and both friends, shows wars aren't simple. Well, no, no, it's it's never it's never simple uh, because it comes down to each individual's personal opinion, what side of the wall they find themselves standing upon. But yeah, from highest to lowest, from the great and the good of the land, down to the, the rank and file, you and me, people just make an instinctive decision about what side they're on. And where a population is split, it's heartbreaking because where a civilization, where a population, where they turn on each other, then all is lost. The game's a bogey then. It's all over. If a civilization, if a people who share a territory, if they can't find ways to live together on their own patch, then that's it. It's all over. You've gone to hell in a handcart. swashbuckling duke lands in Lyme Regis to claim what he considers to be rightly his. In the last battle of any note on English soil, this swaggering challenger was King Charles II's eldest illegitimate son. Returning to England to challenge his Catholic brother King James II, drawing a large force of West Country malcontent to his side, the Pitchfork Rebellion was on. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles. To help support this podcast, which is and always will be free, and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment videos every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It would be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter. And please write a review of this week's podcast and share it with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music's by Malcolm Goldie. The social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy and the finance is taken care of by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production. <laughs>